that sound I start on it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, hi, uh, my name is Peter. I'm going to be talking about uh, functional diversity of mammals and how the functional diversity of mammals in North America has changed over the last 65 million years as a function of both the uh, eco-morphological traits such as or descriptors of species uh, niche, but also environmental traits such as temperature or uh, description of plant nutrition. So the general question I'm dealing with is, when are certain ecologies, ecotypes, or functional groups enriched or depleted in a species pool? And so let's just bring up what a species pool is. Um, it's a nice review. Uh, it brings up the idea that so we have a region, which is the set of all species that occur uh, in that region. You have local communities, which are some subset of this region. And we postulate that by a function of traits in the environment, species disperse to these individual locations. And then through macroevolutionary processes like speciation dispersal and uh, macroecological things like dispersal, we change the structures of these local communities and then change the structure of the regional uh, species pool. So I'm focusing on the structure of the regional species pool represents, in effect, uh, any possible community that could exist within some region in North America. So I'm going to be talking about mammals in terms of their functional groups. And this is actually for marine vertebrates, but the idea is the same. We define some set of traits, which we can use to describe, in this case, the feeding habit of these invertebrates, the, the motility of them, uh, or their tiering, which is kind of how high or low in the water column. Species are then assigned to these individual boxes, and the idea is we look at kind of the structure of how these boxes change over time. I don't visualize the data like this. This is just a nice visualization for thinking about what it is. So a big problem here with dealing with so many different data types, and also a common issue when we're dealing with large-scale questions in uh, evolution and ecology is that we have extremely structured data. We have lots of different sources of data. In this case, we would be looking at butterflies through time. We have their occurrences of these sampling units at each of these different time points. We have environmental variables for each of these different uh, occurrence uh, sampling units through time. We have the phylogeny of these species, and we have the traits of these species. We have to, my goal is to get essentially all of these things to talk to each other uh, so we can predict why things are occurring. So just a little refresher on the age of mammals. Uh, if you aren't a paleontologist, this probably isn't burnt into your mind. This is the last 65 million years of essentially North America. Uh, dinosaurs go extinct like over here, and we progress this way through time. The early Cenozoic is characterized as being a closed environment. Uh, we have large amounts of trees, as opposed to what we'd expect later on, where we have these large open plains that we're much more familiar with, savanna-like habitats. So we're moving from one type of environment towards another while transitioning along the way, and the species are transitioning along the way at the same time. Uh, so for example, there are a lot of primates here, there are absolutely no primates beyond us now. So when we're thinking about these functional groups, they might be originating or going to stage different ways uh, because of their relationship to their environment. And based on some previous work I've done, uh, we can kind of characterize that for locomotor or dietary application. So if we're thinking in just broad categories for locomotor, we would say, uh, based on these results, our boreal taxa are expected to have a very short duration in comparison to ground dwelling or scansorial taxa. Scansorial means they have a mixed ground arboreal, if you think a squirrel. Um, and so this is essentially, duration is another way of thinking about extinction rates. If you have, on average, very short durations, you have a very high extinction rate. If you have, on average, very long, or longer durations with lower extinction rates. We can say the same then for diet, where we'd say these uh, slightly more specialized things have a uh, shorter duration than omnivorous taxa. How would this then play out in terms of how these functional groups are changing over time? And also, how do then environmental factors matter? So here's a general description of my data. Um, we have species. We know stuff about them. They're locomotor type. They're dietary type and their body size, uh, because, yeah. I'm really interested in this part because I'm really trying to understand how species interact with the environment, not just how big they are. We also then have these group level units, which are properties of the discrete time units I'm looking at. We 
have the global temperature and some descriptor of uh, the North American plant communities uh, done by Al Grant. Uh, the general idea is we're trying to put together this what I call a paleo portfolio. It's just the general idea is we're really interested in this magenta box, but we have this orange box. So we have to figure out how to make the orange box look like the magenta box while also taking into account the green and blue box. So the fossil record is incomplete. So when we look and look at uh, data we see, we see gaps. A species appears once, disappears, and then reappears. Most likely existed between them. So we can model some kind of observation process that helps explain, well, we know it was in there. That gives us some estimate of probability of observing something at that given time. So we estimate some true presence matrix, and then uh, species traits predict the species presence through time. The environmental traits then predict both the effect of the trait, but the, uh, also the baseline occurrence. So this is how you write it out. Um, whatever. That's uh, the birth death model. That's the observation model. So yeah, it's a discrete time birth death process. Otherwise, that is a discrete time hidden Markov model with a absorbing state. Pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> so we move and we move on. And so I'm inferring this using STAN, which is this flexible, aggressive, intuitive uh, language for dealing with uh, large scale Bayesian models, which have a lot of cool properties that are great. Um, so I'm fitting this as a straight up uh, just Bayesian model with all the different things you can see, all these choices of priors that are just a long discussion. Um, well, I've highlighted Hamiltonian Monte Carlo, which is its main form of inference. I'm actually using ADVI, which is an approximate um, Bayesian method. While the posteriors are true, I'm making a huge assumption about the structure of the variance of the posterior. So that's okay. So we can get then, this is an awkward to look at plot of the probability of an ecotype originating so we can look at these different ecotypes where we have, or what we call some other functional groups, where we have uh, in their kind of locomotor category and their dietary category, and the boxes that are filled in are those that were observed. And they're generally, you can compare, you say, oh, these things are more similar to that. So like scantorial tags are uh, a little more similar to say, plant grade herbivores. We can then also have this weird ar uh, arboreal tags that are doing uh, very different had a, or have experiencing very different patterns of origination than the other groups. We can then also ask about survival. So this is the probability of the species continuing through time, that it exists at T, it exists at T1. Um, for a lot of these groups, it's either highly variant, it's highly variant and stable uh, through time. There's some structure in some of these groups, but it's hard to pick out when you just look at the probabilities. Uh, and so I'll be returning to that in a little bit. We can also look at the effects of these group level variables. So there are three plant phases I look at, long ago, not so long ago, and close, and then uh, two ways of describing global temperature. We can see that for some groups, uh, temperature might kind of matter, for most others, it doesn't really when it comes to origination. We can then also see there's some uh, structured patterning in terms of origination. Uh, it's a common uh, higher in phase one, lower in phase two, higher in phase three. Uh, so we're at least beginning to understand that uh, the plant phases seem to be really structuring when these uh, functional groups are present as opposed to uh, temperature. Also, temperature, incidentally, is a global measure in this case, and the plant groups are a North American measure, so there you go. We can then look at how these affect survival, and they don't, uh, except in like extreme limited cases. I think that technically has a probability greater than 0.9 of being positive. But in general, what we're seeing in terms of the effects of these group levels on the survival, it's, uh, that's not really what's driving it. It's really all about, in this case, origination, when our species showing up. We can then also get posterior estimates of the individual ecotype uh, diversity through time. You could then convert this into rates, et cetera. But the general idea is we see our boreal taxa in the early Cenozoic, and they're virtually all gone by now. We see a sustained increase in angular grade herbivores, uh, digit grade herbivores, and to a lesser degree, digit, digit grade carnivores. Other groups have some declines uh, in these insectivorous groups. And there's also some smaller increases. But the big patterns we're seeing is loss of arboreal taxa and gain of these uh, horse like things, which makes sense when you think about the American fossil record, and it's the loss of. Uh, primates in the game of horses. 
We can then also phrase this in terms of the relative ecotypic diversity, and we can really see where these expansions, what groups are these expansions coming from. This is uh, herbivore or herbivore greater herbivore than reverse dead. We can also see the loss of carnivorous, uh, arboreal carnivores, and this kind of expansion of vegetarian carnivores. So we can at least begin to pull these structures apart on the reverse planet grade, very, very much uh, Yeah, so they're just kind of these basic results. This is a huge model that's, that I can't even begin to describe all of the results, which is like frustrating, but we can at least summarize what I've talked about. So based on the results that I've shown you for both uh, origination uh, probability and survival probability, we can, uh, and the effect of the group level traits, we can really say that its origination is driving changes in its functional diversity. We're getting uh, new uh, groups are expanding, uh, that, uh, and it origination is driving this, not the selected loss of others. Uh, except in the case of our royal taxa, which become virtually absent by now. I mean, you can go outside, there aren't that many our royal mammals, right? Uh, or go out at night. We also see that uh, these two groups of herbivores that we would characterize as kind of horses, camels, etc., those are what's really expanding in a marked way. They're expanding virtually consistently through time as opposed to uh, like what I've been doing on a random level. So that's pretty cool. It's describing that we might have this kind of replacement associated with the, uh, the open closeness of the environment. Also, to say again, the environmental covariates are really associated with these. Uh, Origination, not survival. So, which is kind of cool because, at least when it comes to the functional groups, we're always talking about how, uh, at least in paleontology, how the environment might affect uh, extinction or survival in mammals. And there's a big discussion about that it doesn't affect extinction. Well, it doesn't really, but it affects origination, which adds a nuance to the question we have. Uh, I have a bunch of people to thank. Uh, my committee, who graduated me, finished. Uh, my lab, you can find me on the internet with this oversized image. I get all my data from this free to use service. Uh, it's fantastic. It needs, it needs support. So, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so, I technically have time for questions. Yeah, John? Mm -hmm. uh, did you, for the preservation rate, uh, no, so I let each functional group have, actually I'm trying to remember, so I had preservation at least be a function, uh, have body size as a predictor uh, to help deal with that. One of my goals is to actually go uh, fully multi-level with it and model it the exact same way I model organization and uh, survival. Part of it is just Great, thanks.